Tonight, a special edition of Top Story live from Mayfield, Kentucky, a community devastated by one of the deadliest tornado outbreaks our country has ever seen. At least 74 people are dead and more than 100 still unaccounted for after a string of powerful tornadoes tore across six states in the middle of the night. One of the twisters on the ground for more than 200 miles, leaving a massive trail of devastation in its wake. 300 National Guardsmen now on the ground in Kentucky. The search for survivors growing more desperate by the minute. Tragic losses. Tonight, we're learning more about the victims. The youngest, just two months old. One town of just 300 people losing at least 11 of its own. Kate Snow is there, plus six workers killed at an Amazon warehouse in Illinois. One mother sharing the story of her son's incredible bravery, what he did in his final moments. Survivor story. Our Dasha Burns speaking with one man in his 80s, trapped in his home in Bowling Green, Kentucky, rescued by a neighbor he had never even met. That inspiring story of neighborly love ahead. And the other major headline tonight, the grim pandemic milestone. More than 800,000 Americans have now died from COVID-19 as the Delta variant fuels yet another surge. Cases rising in 40 states. Hospitals overwhelmed. The highly contagious Omicron variant confirmed in at least 30 states. Plus, Meadows in contempt. A House panel voting as we come on the air expected to recommend holding former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in contempt for refusing to cooperate with their investigation into the deadly January 6 riot. We're live on the Hill tonight. And treasured photos, a remarkable demonstration of the power of this storm. One family's memento ending up 130 miles away. The community coming together to get it back to its owners. Top Story starts right now. And good evening, I'm Tom Yamas. We begin top story tonight from Mayfield, Kentucky, a town and a state in mourning. Just behind me, one of the buildings that has been devastated here in this town. This is First Presbyterian, a church that has served this community for more than 100 years. This is another live look. That was the nursery of the church on the second floor. You can see there is no roof and very little of that second floor. We are people here just starting to pick up the pieces from that deadly tornado outbreak and the scope of the destruction here in Mayfield is difficult to put into words. It is 360 degrees. It is everywhere you look. This drone footage, you can see it here, neighborhood after neighborhood completely obliterated. Many of the historic buildings downtown are gone. The storm striking in the dead of night across six states. Many people at home asleep. This funnel cloud, take a look, spotted in central Kentucky. When the lightning strikes, you can see that monster storm. The governor here delivering heartbreaking news today, confirming at least 74 people are dead, more than 100 still unaccounted for. In Warren County alone, just to our east, at least 22 people killed, including two infants. At least eight people were killed at the candle factory here in Mayfield. We have a major update tonight there. After the roof collapsed, more than 100 people were working overtime and overnight when the tornado hit. We'll speak to one of those people lucky enough to get out. And the resiliency of the people here on full display, neighbors out today trying to help neighbors, trying to sift through all of this damage, all of the wreckage, looking to salvage whatever they can. The massive cleanup effort ahead is just getting started. Our team is live all across the path of destruction tonight, but we begin right here in Kentucky where rescue teams are still desperately searching for survivors. Tonight, that tornado outbreak leaving a trail of destruction 200 miles long, and now the death toll growing. Some towns in the South and Midwest blown off the map. More than 30 tornadoes ripping through six states, leveling every structure in their path. This morning, we were with a group of firefighters who had just arrived and within minutes, combing the mounds of rubble in front of them. Bodies or people or whatever, sir. In Kentucky, those twisters, the deadliest in the state's history, leaving more than 70 people dead. And tonight, there is still more than 100 unaccounted for. Being there helping. Um, you go from grief to shock to being resolute, span of 10 minutes, and, 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 and then you go back. Um, it's hard to understand how something like this or why something like this happens. It is just awful. One of the dead, two-month-old Oakland Coon, who died as a result of injuries sustained in tornadoes in Dawson Springs. At least eight of those fatalities occurred after the roof of a candle factory in Mayfield collapsed. One of the town's largest employers had more than 100 people working overnight when the tornado struck.
For three days, search teams combing this Mayfield candle factory, where staff on the overnight shift were busy working on holiday orders when the deadly weather moved in. These images showing the building before and after that monster tornado tore through this Kentucky town. Employees at the factory telling NBC News they were told to go back to work after the first storm sirens went off hours before the twister hit. We knew that the tornado was coming. We, we knew it was going to happen. Um, we, were, we were scared. We spoke to 30-year-old Lauren Barclay in her hospital bed. She says she was working on the factory line when the roof started to rip off. We heard the wind pick up outside and our ears started popping. And I looked at my best friend, Megan, who worked with me, and I said, there, there's a tornado. She ran for the bathroom, then remembers going airborne. You were launched into the air? We wound up about six or seven feet away from where we were standing when we got back there. The CEO of the company spoke with NBC's Kate Snow. He says no one was forced to stay or work the night the tornado hit. If you knew the weather was coming, was there any thought to maybe suspending production? If we believed that we could do anything differently, you know, in hindsight, of course, I think all of us would do something differently. It's such a gamble to say leave, you know, because the last thing you do, it says don't get in your car. You know, that's what experts say. At least six workers at the candle factory telling NBC News they were told to stay, including Kimberly Hendrickson. Did anybody give you the option to go home after no. the first alarm? No. Do you think that was a mistake? Yes, they should allow, allow or let people leave that wanted to leave to leave. Hendrickson and her daughter sheltered in place as the factory collapsed around them. She says they ended up in a vat of fragrance oil. You can still smell that scent of candles all over her and her hospital room. I had a gentleman on top of me that was pinned and he couldn't move. Her pelvis broken, her skin burned. She says a co-worker died right next to her. I'm just thankful that I didn't lose my daughter and that I didn't die on top of my child. That was my worst fears. Those twisters then moving east to Bowling Green, reducing homes to rubble. It's never going to be the same. My neighborhood isn't going to be the same, and the town isn't going to be the same. In Illinois, at least six people died after the storm decimated an Amazon warehouse in Edwardsville. Six individuals clocked in on Friday, and they never came home. An in additional person is still receiving medical treatment. We are ensuring that there is a full understanding of what happened to these individuals in their final moments. Authorities in Tennessee rescuing this woman whose mobile home was picked up by a tornado and thrown on top of her, pinning her from the waist down. Missouri also suffering fatalities, including one child. And in Arkansas, two people are dead, one at this nursing home in Marinette. President Biden set to travel to Kentucky on Wednesday, issuing emergency declarations for that state, along with Illinois. With each passing day, the human impact of this devastation is uh, just uh, the depth of the losses are becoming more and more apparent. I'll get you another one. Okay. I'll get you another one. And tonight we have a couple of updates on that candle factory. First, one of the workers there told us that after that first storm siren, she did witness some people leave the factory. Also tonight, the company tells me that they have now accounted for all of their employees there. 110 employees decided to stay for one reason or another. We know that eight have died. The company now saying they've spoken to 102 of those other employees and that right now no one is missing. As Mayfield reels from this storm's destruction, we want to bring in Mark Saxon, who was working at that candle factory on Friday night, along with his grandfather, Ben, who has lived in this community for more than 60 years. And Mark, I want to start with you. The, the big question tonight is, did workers have the opportunity? Were they, were they informed that they could leave after that first storm siren? I know it was a chaotic time, but do, do you think it was fair what happened to those workers? No, I don't think it was fair because they should have let us go home. I went to another factory that I work at, which is Hickory Point, and they had no employees. So I just don't understand why we wasn't sent home. Yes, they do have a policy that says that you can leave at any time. A COVID policy. A COVID policy. But supervisors have the discretion to fire you or let you go whenever they want, without reason, and that's in the policy. The company is saying that they didn't force anyone to work, that they didn't force anyone to come into work. Uh, that, that's what they're saying right now, and they mentioned the COVID policy. I want to ask you, what was it like to be inside of a factory like that when the, when the roof just gets ripped right off? Uh, it was devastating. I was terrified. I didn't believe it was happening. 
I was actually laughing because I thought it was like, I was just hysterical, like I couldn't believe it. It wasn't funny, but it was just hysterical, you know? You had a breakdown of sorts. Yeah, like I was shocked, like I was, I was in a state of shock and the wall just came right here to my face and it never touched me in my face, but it, it moved me. Like the wall moved me the whole time, but it never closed in on me. Your grandfather is Ben. Ben, I know you've been here for more than 60 years. Yeah. 92 years old, mm -hmm. still going strong. W what was it like for you that night? What do you remember? Well, uh, the well, most things I remember is uh, the weather said we had 10 minutes to take cover. So we, I opened up my brother's house and I, I taken in several of the, oh, here's about just close to 15 of us in the house. 15 people, 16 yeah. people in one home, okay. And we was in there, went to the basement. Then I looked out the window and you could see, you know, the leaves from the lightning. The lightning was steady and the leaves were just whirling. And I told some of them that, but, you know, and so we got away from the wonder. And just as we got away from the wonder, uh, it looked like uh, we was away from one about three seconds. And it went boom. And, it just, and that's all we could hear. The rest of it was just, you know, uh, little noise and stuff. Mm -hmm. so, were, were you, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one in, in your 60 no, plus years? I've been, I've been in several tornadoes, but I've never been in there and, and being this close. We was, we was just between one house here and one house there. So the house next to us, it collapsed, hit and everybody. It was uh, some, it was three or four people in hit, but they was on the backside, which they got away with safe. Mark, so we finally got to them yeah. to see, you know, about them, and they were safe. So we were glad of that. And then uh, from that, uh, we was looking out there where my car was sitting. It, it knocked the wind out of it. Okay. Then my son's car, it did uh, hit, and the, and the other car had taken two windows out. Okay, Mark, so, what, what does this community do now? We just rebuild. It's a close-knit community. Everybody know each other. We all play sports together. We all interact together. So we got to rebuild together. Okay, Mark Saxon, his mm -hmm. grandfather, Ben, we thank you for your time, gentlemen. Uh, this disaster not only brought destruction but unspeakable pain to so many families all across this region. For some, the tornado took so much more than just their homes. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow is in Bremen, Kentucky with this heartbreaking story. So what street was this? This is the, the little area I was telling you about earlier, the May Apple Lane. It was actually pretty, pretty nice little, uh, little area. Bremen, Kentucky is wounded. Farmland littered with debris. The tornado came from over there. It, it was so wide, it wiped out this entire subdivision. Less than 300 people live here, 11 of them now gone. Loss beyond words. This was the house right yeah. behind you? Like, is this the foundation? Yeah, that, I mean, right here's the porch. Where did it go? It that tree right there, most of it was wrapped around the tree. Andrew Oglesby, his wife Charity, and five-month-old Chase lived here. Chase had just rolled over for the first time on Friday. Moments after the tornado swept over them, Andrew called his sister Stephanie and her fiancé Zach. He said, my house is gone, I can't find my baby. And he said, Charity's strapped. He said, I can't find my baby? Yeah. When Chase was found, they raced him to the fire department, but it was too late. Can you even describe? how it feels now. Broken, <laughs> really no. Chase's parents are still in the hospital. Andrew has a bad neck injury. Charity had neurosurgery on her spine, but they say it's a miracle they're alive. In Bremen, unfortunately, they're not alone in their grief. There's other people that her family knows that died too. You'll have a community of grief now. You'll have a community to lean on. Right. Yeah, yeah we're all gonna just getting dirt together the best we can. The family started a fund to help with hospital bills and so much more. They, they literally lost more than everything, you know. They lost their son. Yeah. yeah. They're grateful for everyone who's come to help. Someone even found the family's Christmas tree. Yeah, this was their Christmas tree. Um, someone, someone found it in the rubble. A cross nearby in honor of a little boy. Kate Snow joins us now from Bremen, Kentucky. Kate, it is, it is all just so sad. How are the parents doing and, and why are they choosing to speak out? 
Yeah, I think as parents, Tom, we, we feel it for them. Uh, they are doing okay. She's on a ventilator, Charity. She had surgery. She's recovering from that. Uh, and then Andrew today actually took some steps for the first time using a walker, uh, but he's got a lot of injuries too. He's got a broken jaw and uh, the neck injuries that he's got. The reason that the other family members wanted to speak out uh, that you heard from is they said a couple reasons. They said, one, um, they wanted people to remember Chase, and two, they wanted want to thank people, thank all their neighbors, but also strangers who've shown up to just help. Tom. Kate Snow, who's done some incredible reporting over the last three days here from Kentucky. Kate, we thank you for being on Top Story tonight. And despite all the pain and loss, we've all found stories of heroism and survival. In Bowling Green, a man rushed to rescue his elderly neighbor from his collapsed home. Now this hero and his neighbor share an unbreakable bond. NBC's Dasha Burns has those details. Behind this red door is Steve Newman's childhood. When you first walk in, it's, you know, all your memories growing up here. You know, they kind of rush back to you. Friday night, Steve's father, Bob, was behind that door, too. Where were you sitting when the alarm went off? I was sitting on that couch right there. In the room that's gone now? In the room that's gone. As the tornado raced toward him, Bob moved toward safety. I got down on the floor and crawled in that hallway door and the storm hit about then and it blew everything in. When I heard a lot of people screaming outside, I ran outside and I saw Bob standing, halfway standing, blood all over his face. This is Bob's neighbor, Mong U, holding the boots he gave to Bob to put on his bare feet when he found him. I can't even get out of the house, you know, all the debris everywhere. And I had a neighbor up here, he had, a, somebody had a flashlight outside and he came up, I thought he was a fireman, and he helped me clear the debris and get me out. And they end up putting me up for the night. Just a neighbor right over here. I was lucky to have a good neighbor. By the time we met Bob, these neighbors had become something more. What do you think about your neighbors after all of this? I love them. They're, they come together when things get rough. Proving that while behind this door is a broken house, a home still stands. Dasha Burns joins us now from Bowling Green, Kentucky. And Dasha, it truly is incredible when you cover these types of natural disasters. So many people hurt, so many people dead, and yet so many people still find time to come together and help each other out. And those are the stories you found where you were today. Yeah, Tom, that's right. I mean, I think you've seen similar uh, acts of kindness where you are. It's been remarkable to watch this flood of help that has come into this area, into Bowling Green. We've seen people coming, giving out meals, giving out water, people bringing their own chainsaws, their own trucks, helping to clear out the debris. The majority of people we saw working in this neighborhood today were actually volunteers from around the community, from across Kentucky, even from outside of the state. And it's, it's so funny, Tom. Um, you know, whenever people would come by to bring meals to people like like Bob and his family here, everyone I heard say, no, no, there's someone else who needs it more than me. The, the generosity here, despite these circumstances, is just remarkable. It is considering that we're hitting freezing temperatures on some nights and people are out of electricity, out of water in some cases. So that that truly is just really, really beautiful. You mentioned Bob has lived there for 50 years. That's a long time. Was he able to salvage anything from the rubble? Yeah, you know, there are bits and pieces that are still intact. It, it was we were standing right here, Tom, when uh, Bob was in a conversation with a neighbor who pulled out a gold watch that he had found down the road here a, a block or so away. And it turns out uh, that was a, a watch that uh, that Bob had owned. It looked like something he had had uh, for maybe decades. And that's what's amazing, too. As you dig through the rubble, you find these uh, little bits and pieces of, of memory, uh, a children's toy, a, a wagon, uh, things that remind people this this is home. And it's just going to take some time to get it back, Tom. And Dasha, we're actually going to show our viewers the stories of some of those mementos, how they were spread out not only over neighborhoods, but also some states as well. All right, Dasha Burns for us tonight on Top Story. Dasha, we thank you. We want to bring you another personal story coming out of the devastation in Kentucky. Our Ellison Barber met a woman in one of the hardest hit areas. She says she made it out by the grace of God and helped her community make it through the night. If I had to come home and 
and gone to my bed like I was really wanting to, I wouldn't be here. I would have either been blown out in the backyard like some of my other neighbors or it, the, because of the ceiling had crashed on my, on my bed. And so I wouldn't have made it. Anita Black's home is completely destroyed, but tonight she feels blessed to have survived the harrowing storm. In just seconds, it was over. And so that's the hardest thing probably to get your head wrapped around is that everything is gone so fast. Anita's house doesn't have a basement, so she decided to shelter in a neighbor's. She felt the tornado whip through the house shake and she looked up. She saw the dark, stormy sky. You're just looking up from the basement thinking you ought to be seeing what was would have been her kitchen. And it was, there was nothing, nothing. It was just as black as could be. And then the rain started real, real heavy. And, and it was just, it's just unimaginable. Anita ran across the street and started looking for her neighbors, trying to see if they were alive. Some were trapped in their collapsed home. She and other neighbors found survivors and pulled people through basement windows out from under collapsed walls. Soon she'd learn others did not survive. We did lose a few neighbors out back, and that troubles me because I know this one lady especially had to have been so scared, and that just hurts me. Knowing they had to move quickly, Anita grabbed her keys and led her neighbors to safety at a bank where she works. I work just at the end of the street, and, and we took about 25 of my neighbors, we took down to the end of the street. The roof is still on the bank. And so I just unlocked the bank and we went in and we set up shop and had shelter for the night. And at least we had a warm, dry place to be for the night. Through all of the terror, all of the devastation, neighbors like Anita ran to help each other. People who would never call themselves heroes became exactly that. Now they need others to help them. Do you think this community can rebuild? I hope so. It'll it'll take a lot of help to, to rebuild it. I don't know that we'll ever this town will ever recover. It's just devastating. I don't know. It's just kind of like you look around. This is what you see on TV. You don't see that here. And Ellison Barber joins us now live from Dawson Springs, Kentucky. There. Ellison, Anita said three of her neighbors had died. We saw the images in the video of the neighborhood where you are. We can see that live shot behind you, which is just, as the governor has said, unimaginable. How is that neighborhood doing? And are there still people missing from her street? There are still people missing from the entirety of Dawson Springs that was hit by this tornado. Exactly how many, we do not know. 13 people have died in Dawson Springs. I was speaking to the coroner for this county this morning, and he told me that he hopes the death toll doesn't rise, but he's afraid that it will in part because they still have people missing from this apartment complex. There are at least half a dozen buildings in this area right now, this apartment community all of them nearly destroyed. Tom. Ellison Barber with a look at just one of the so many neighborhoods that we have across this state suffering tonight. Ellison, we thank you for that. This is new tonight. An investigation begins into that destroyed Amazon warehouse in Illinois that left six people killed. Amazon could face penalties if safety or health violations are found. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky shares some of the harrowing stories of what happened when the tornado touched down. <laughs> so for the cope family the pain too much to bear father lynn unable to put his son clay's loss into words the 29 year old inside the amazon warehouse friday when the storm moved in over the phone the navy vet told his mom he was helping co-workers to shelter just minutes before the twister struck knowing that clay told others to get to safety it doesn't surprise me not at all. That's who he was. It just was who he was. Cope, one of six workers killed, ranging in age from 26 to 62. The EF3 tornado nearly cut the football field size warehouse in half. 40 foot concrete walls collapsed, causing the roof to cave in. Amazon telling NBC News all 46 workers inside were instructed to move to a protected sheltered area as soon as sirens went off. But not everyone made it there. And our leaders on the site really immediately began to shelter people in place and getting people to move into the sheltered areas. Tonight, Amazon adds it welcomes a newly announced investigation from OSHA, which investigates all workplace deaths. 
The agency says they've had staff on site since Saturday inspecting safety code compliance. And Amazon founder Jeff Bezos also facing criticism over the weekend for posting about his Blue Origin spaceflight at the same time as crews were digging through this rubble searching for bodies. Bezos has since said that he is heartbroken over the loss of Amazon teammates. Tom. Morgan Chesky for us tonight from Illinois. We do want to mention we are going to have much more stories from the tornado zone in our next half hour, including a live interview with a local meteorologist who many are calling a hero. They say he and his team saved more lives than anyone else. That's coming up in our next half hour. But we do want to turn now to the pandemic and its devastating death toll here in the U.S. An NBC News tally shows that more than 800,000 Americans have now lost their lives from COVID-19, more than any other country. This as 33 states have seen an increase in deaths in recent weeks. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has that report. Inside the nation's busiest hospitals, there was no time to reflect on the loss. As our nation surpasses a staggering 800,000 deaths, the most devastating wave of COVID infections is right now overwhelming many medical centers across the Northeast and Great Lakes. More national disaster teams are arriving at hospitals as the U.S. now tops 50 million cases. Spectrum Health West in Michigan just set their single-day record for new admissions and expect to break it every day this week. Quite honestly, it makes me want to cry. When the vaccines came out a year ago, I thought we'd never get anywhere close to this, and here we still are. As hospitalizations rise 37 percent, the steady and relentless climb to 800,000 lives lost took under two years. According to the CDC, 76 percent of deaths are those 65 and older. But the numbers are names for families who lost loved ones like Diana Sawhill. You wake up every morning and you have to realize again that that person is gone. So you relive it every day. While Delta does damage, Omicron is fueling new concern. California is set to re-implement indoor mask mandates as cases skyrocket 47% since Thanksgiving. It took less than two weeks for the highly infectious mutation to be identified in half the country. Boosters say experts are our best defense, but tonight for 800,000 families, it's far too late. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. We thank Miguel for that. To Capitol Hill now and the big headline surrounding the vote to hold former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in contempt of Congress. The January 6th committee likely to condemn a second Trump administration official to account for failing to cooperate with his investigation. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig has the details. Lawmakers investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol have run out of patience with Mark Meadows. Tonight, the committee beginning the process of holding Donald Trump's chief of staff in contempt of Congress for refusing to testify despite a September subpoena. Mark Meadows made the decision to cooperate and then he made the decision to uncooperate. Uh, and as a result, we're going to have to hold him in criminal contempt. Meadows' attorney arguing a contempt referral would be unjust, unwise and unfair and that his client is protected by executive privilege asserted by Trump, privilege the Biden administration has waived. The president has claimed executive privilege. I'm going to honor that. I'm not going to be the first uh, chief of staff to, to actually waive that. It's not mine to waive, and, uh, and it's really not Congress's to waive. In a new report, the committee says they've got questions about documents Meadows has handed over, which shed light on what the Trump White House knew about the insurrection before it began. On January 5th, Meadows sent an email to an undisclosed person saying the National Guard would be present on the 6th to, quote, protect pro-Trump people. He used his private cell phone to talk with at least one rally planner who may have expressed safety concerns about the event. And in the weeks between the election and the attack, Meadows was in touch with state and local lawmakers about a, quote, highly controversial plan to overturn election results. I love it, he texted one back. The thousands of documents that Meadows turned over show what a direct witness he is to so many of the central events the committee is investigating. All right, Garrett Haig joins us now live from Capitol Hill. And Garrett, Meadows is in such a weird sort of position, right? Because first he cooperates and then he doesn't. He files a lawsuit. What's next for him? 
Well, Meadows has also already turned over these thousands of pages of documents, which right now form the backbone of the committee's investigation. The committee's meeting right now, Tom, they could vote any minute now. Then I expect we'll see the full House vote, possibly as early as tomorrow, to hold Meadows in contempt. Then it's up to the DOJ to decide what they want to do, and that's not a clear-cut case. With Steve Bannon, they took more than three weeks to make their decision, a much cleaner legal case with Meadows. We could be waiting for quite some time, Tom. All right, Garrett, we thank you for that. Coming up on Top Story, the latest on the devastating tornadoes. The meteorologist who put out the warnings joins us live to talk about the historic trail of destruction, plus the horrifying cruise ship tragedy, a young woman falling overboard, rescue teams unable to recover a body, authorities investigating the cause, and the disturbing video caught on camera, an SUV striking a nine-year-old, the child miraculously getting up police now searching for the suspect top story just getting started stay with us back now with the suspect in that Michigan high school shooting Ethan Crumley back in court today accused of killing four of his fellow students today his lawyers arguing the defendant should be moved to juvenile detention plus the 100 million dollar civil lawsuit against the school district for failing to keep, keep students safe NBC News correspondent Katie Beck has the latest. Tonight, accused school shooter Ethan Crumley returning to court in Michigan. Could you state your full name for us, please? The 15-year-old is charged as an adult with murder, terrorism, and other counts for allegedly killing four students and wounding seven other people during a November 30th shooting at Oxford High School. I so have the flashbacks of hearing the gunshots and the crying and sadness. I can't move on from this because I know four kids won't be able to move on from this. Crumley's defense arguing that he should be moved back to an Oakland County juvenile detention facility because he could hear adult inmates inside the jail. I do have concerns for him and his, his mental and emotional well-being. Jail isn't conducive, it's not designed for juveniles. Judge Carniac denying the request. I still feel strongly about that, that his um, conduct could be a menace to other juveniles. As Crumley faces his charges, a federal civil lawsuit has been filed against the Oxford Community School District. The $100 million suit was filed on behalf of a student who was shot in the neck during the shooting and her sister by their father, Jeffrey Franz. The lawsuit alleges the school failed to protect students from a peer who was deranged and homicidal. Experts calling the action a long shot. Public schools are part of the government. Generally speaking, the government can't be sued unless it gives its permission to be sued. In a filing in the federal suit, the Franz attorneys also accused the district of destroying crucial evidence linked to Crumley's case. One attorney writing in a filing on Friday, quote, not only did defendants fail to take necessary steps to preserve the evidence, but they willfully destructed the evidence by deleting the web pages and social media accounts. U.S. District Judge Terrence Burke has ordered the school to keep all evidence related to the case. An attorney for the Oxford School District saying the accusations are totally false. Crumley is set to appear at another court hearing on January 7th. Crumley's attorney has not responded to NBC's request for comment. Katie Beck, NBC News. All right, coming up on Top Story, the massive legal settlement. USA Gymnastics agreeing to pay hundreds of millions of dollars to the victims of Larry Nassar in the sex abuse scandal. Those victims, some of the biggest names in the sport. And the announcement from the White House, the military heroes who will get the highest honor, what they did to save the lives of their fellow service members. Coming up on Top Story, stay with us. Back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin tonight with a massive settlement reached in the Larry Nassar sex abuse scandal. USA Gymnastics and the U.S. Olympic Committee agreeing to pay $380 million to Nassar's victims. The settlement includes claims from Olympic gold medalists Simone Biles, Ali Raisman, and Michaela Mo Michaela Maroney, and hundreds of other athletes. USA Gymnastics will also be required to have a survivor of sex abuse on its board at all times moving forward. The U.S. Coast Guard has suspended its search for a cruise ship passenger that went overboard. The woman, believed to be in her 20s, fell over the side of the Carnival Miracle ship in the middle of the night on Saturday. Rescue teams spent more than 31 hours looking for her off the coast of Mexico, but were unable to make a recovery. Federal authorities are still investigating the cause of that incident. 
and a shocking hit and run caught on camera near Washington. Ring camera video shows an SUV barreling around a corner near an elementary school, striking a nine-year-old boy on his bike, sending him flying. The boy immediately able to get up. His mother says he is okay. Metropolitan police are still searching for that suspect. And the White House has announced this year's Medal of Honor recipients. The military's highest honor will be awarded to Sergeant First Class Christopher Selis, who died defending a helicopter evacuating wounded soldiers in 2018. Master Sergeant Earl Plumley, who was injured while fighting off insurgents in Afghanistan in 2013, and Sergeant First Class Alwyn Cash, who gave his life rescuing fellow soldiers from a burning vehicle in Iraq. In, in 2005, I should say. We want to return now to our live tornado coverage here in Mayfield. Members in this community attributing the survival and preparedness of so many to the dedicated meteorologists who worked tirelessly through the night, who tracked the catastrophic series of tornadoes and gave real-time updates. One person te telling us they are true lifesavers. WPSD meteorologist Noah Bregren joins me now here live. He was tracking these tornadoes, keeping people informed. So Noah, when you first saw this storm pop up on your radar, what was the first thought you had? We knew instantly it, it was bad. It popped up as a rain shower near Little Rock at about five o'clock in the afternoon. And it ended up going from a rain shower to a severe thunderstorm to a tornado warning near Jonesboro. And it's once it got to Jonesboro that me, our chief meteorologist and the whole team, all of us looked at each other and we all said, this is not good. Because we knew that the atmosphere ahead of that thing, it wasn't weakening. This was not a one little storm that was gonna come up and go down. It was there and it was there to stay. Did you know it was going to be this powerful and this deadly and this destructive? Days in advance, you know, it's one thing to look at a computer screen and computer models. You know, we rely on our education as meteorologists. We, we know the potential the atmosphere has. And it's one thing to know on a computer screen the potential. It's another thing to see that realized to the fullest. And this was the rarest, most fullest realization of that. What was the worst part of that night for you? Knowing that we had people that were going to have their lives changed, and we had people at the station whose families and friends, including some of mine and the whole weather team, were in the path, and it went from just looking at the radar to let's save as many people as we can, no matter how. When you're in that situation, you don't want to scare people, but you do want to alert them because, I mean, every second, every minute is so important. We, we know that now from the people who were stuck in the candle factory and, and, and there's so many lives lost across this area as well. What was your tone that night and, and, and how did you express that without just giving utter terror to people who really had to prepare in that moment? We always try to inform that alarm. It's one of our mottos at the weather station because, you know, keeping people calm is what saved them. You know, had we come on at six o'clock and said, everybody needs to leave your house now and drive north, drive south, we would have caused the mass hysteria and panic. And in the middle of the moment, uh, it was really more of, here's what you need to do. You need to lay in your bathtub. You need to get in the closet. Because a lot of people here don't have basements. This is an area of the country where right. more houses than not don't have basements. So we can't, it's not like the Northeast or up near Chicago. Nobody can go in their basement. I mean, they're stuck in their house or their mobile home, and they have to shelter where they work. When you saw that tornado form, the several tornadoes, I should say, form on the radar, did you have any idea this was going to be the result? We knew it was possible. Did we want to believe it? <laughs> Heck no. Heck no. And the fact that it went as long as it did, I mean, I, it's indescribable. When you, when you stepped out of the studio and you, you looked around, what would you think? We were all at a loss for words. I mean, we, we hadn't been back in the studio till earlier yesterday, and when we walked past the green screen, the three of us, the three of us, Trent, Kaylee, and myself, our weather team, we just stopped and froze. I mean, it was just an instant flashback to knowing that people's lives were permanently changed. And th we did what we could in the moment. WPSD meteorologist Noah Bregwin, people really called you a hero. That's why I wanted to talk to you today. We were, we're out at the heroes. hospital. I know you're saying that we were at the hospital and all the nurses were saying you guys were the heroes. They said you guys really alerted everyone. You did a good job. So thank you for that. And you guys saved a lot of lives that night. Thanks for having us. Here. All right, Noah. We want to turn now uh, to the Americas, where we look at stories from the U.S. and across Latin America. And tonight, the group in Georgia accused of creating a modern-day slavery operation charged with luring migrants from Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras with temporary visas and then making them work for pennies. 
Two workers dying after allegedly being forced to work in harsh conditions. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard tonight with the latest on that investigation. Prosecutors calling it modern day slavery in the fields of southern Georgia. Years worth of damning, horrific allegations. A new 54 page indictment by the U.S. Department of Justice charging 24 individuals as part of what it calls Operation Blooming Onion. Prosecutors say the defendants defrauded the U.S.'s H 2A guest farm worker visa program. When many of those would be farm workers arrived to the U.S., the indictment alleges they were abused and exploited. A group of people. In the U.S. has sold the American dream, kept them in deplorable conditions, held their documents, um, forced them to work for little or no pay, and systematically abused them. All at the hands of what the DOJ is calling a transnational criminal organization, referred to as Patricio TCO, in operation since at least 2015. Victims allegedly forced to live in cramped, dirty trailers with raw sewage leaking into the trailers, threatened them with deportation, and detained them in a work camp surrounded by an electric fence. And in 2018, 30 individuals allegedly sold to another man in Indiana for $21,481. What makes these H-2A workers susceptible to abuse? They depend on the employer for their transportation their food, their housing, their wages, whether they go to get medical help, the workers cannot complain because if they complain, they'll lose their jobs. The acting U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Georgia, David Estes, stating Operation Blooming Onion frees more than 100 individuals from the shackles of modern day slavery and will hold accountable those who put them in chains. In addition to the charges, grim allegations. One individual identified as victim number 12, repeatedly raped by a member of the criminal ring. But in 2019, one worker allegedly died from a heat stroke when he was outside working in the fields. And in 2020, another worker allegedly died when he was cleaning a Patricio Ticio labor camp that did not have air conditioning. This indictment documents 66 victims, but the U.S. Attorney's Office says they are looking to account for more. How critical are these workers for Georgia's economy? Last year, we came in at just over 27,000 H-2A workers um, in Georgia. The obligation an employer has to an H-2A worker is no different than they have to a domestic worker. An NBC News investigations team last year visited more than a dozen H-2A sites, including in Georgia. No hubo paga para nosotros. Where violations were found to be prevalent. The Department of Labor in 2019 documenting about 12,000 violations by employers across the country under the H-2A visa program. This man, not related to Operation Blooming Onion, sharing his story. The conditions and the things that were described in these indictments are not surprising to us, um, not unusual. So is it a matter of whether the U.S. puts the resources behind to go in and investigate and charge for these types of conditions? It is. It is whether the U.S. government puts money and effort into checking workplace sites and really making sure that H-2A guest workers are taken care of and not exploited. All right, Vaughn Hilliard joins us now from New York. And Vaughn, you just said there that there might be other groups like this, but, but what is the government doing to ensure workers with H-2A visas are, are not being abused? Tom, the head of the Department of Homeland Security, Mayorkas, he said that this under this Biden administration, they want to shift their resources to going after these sort of uh, exploitive bosses. Instead, when you saw it under the Trump administration, there was the targeting of these massive workplace raids in which hundreds of undocumented individuals would be arrested. But what you see here, there, for example, are more than 200,000 H-2A workers here that are guest workers every single year. And what you see from these 
indictments of these 24 individuals are hundreds of workers here who essentially uh, were not granted the rights uh, granted to them through this visa worker program. We're talking about individuals who were living surrounded by, uh, uh, by sewage, individuals who had guns to their heads while working, individuals who were picking onions and only getting paid for 20 cents for every bucket that they picked. These were the types of conditions that the government under the Biden administration said that they want to target these exploitive bosses. Tom? All right, Vaughn Hilliard with us for us tonight. Vaughn, thank you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch. The G7 issuing a stern warning to Russia as tensions escalate at the border. Leaders from the seven of the world's most powerful democracies threatening massive consequences and severe costs if Putin invades Ukraine. The warning coming as Russia has sent more than 100,000 troops to its border. Moscow has denied any plans to move troops into Ukraine. Officials in Europe warned that the Omicron variant could soon become the dominant strain, the highly contagious variant already detected in at least 20 European countries. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson predicting a tidal wave of infections from Omicron, announcing the country's first death due to the new variant today. All adults in the UK now eligible for boosters, crowds lining up at hospitals across the country to get their shots. And a stunning view of Earth from more than 250 miles in the sky. Remarkable time-lapse video shows the International Space Station completing an entire orbit around the Earth. The video captured by Japanese billionaire Yusaka Miyazawa. He's on board the ISS as part of a 12-day expedition. The cost of his trip believed to be as much as $40 million. All right, coming up later on Top Story, the family photo discovered more than 100 miles from home, demonstrating the unbelievable power of the storms here in Kentucky. And tributes pouring in for Vicente Fernandez, the king of Mexican ranchero music. Fans all across the globe mourning his loss. More on his life and legacy when we come back. Back down top story, mourning a musical legend, Vicente Fernandez, known as the king of Mexican ranchero music, passing away at 81 years old. Rahima Ellis has a look back at the music, the marathon concerts, and the fans who soaked it up for decades. across the Americas gathered to mourn the passing of Vicente Fernandez, the king of Mexican ranchero music. He was 81 and was hospitalized after a fall. Known as Chente to generations of listeners, Fernandez's music embodied the rough-hewn spirit of rural Mexico. He also spoke to the Mexican diaspora in the United States. Presente was always birthday parties, any celebration, cleaning time, Chente on there, you know? Fernandez's career spanned five decades and hundreds of millions of record sales. Mujeres de Venus, perhaps the most popular song, has more than 80 million listens on Spotify. His concerts were musical marathons. During his farewell show in 2016, in front of 80,000 people, Fernandez sang 40 songs for more than four hours. He continued recording until 2020. His last album won a Latin Grammy. He also starred in more than 30 films, alongside some of Mexico's biggest movie stars. In recent years, he was accused of sexism and homophobia. In 2019, Fernandez told an interviewer he had refused a liver transplant because the donated organ might, quote, come from a homosexual or an addict. For his millions of fans, however, Fernandez will always be El Rey, the king. Rahima Ellis, NBC News. We thank Rahima for that. When we come back, the remarkable moment of hope amid all this tragedy, the treasured family photo discovered more than 100 miles from home, blown away in the power of the storm, the community coming together to find the family of the people. Picture, stay with us. Finally tonight, we wanted to show you the power of this storm in more ways than one. Just behind me, we told you, is a church that is more than 100 years old. 
here where we are tonight in Kentucky. You can see the second floor of that church is completely gone. You can see the nursery exposed there just slightly. But there have been mementos spread out all over this area, including all across states. Coming up right now, a story you may not believe. A family photo blown away so far away and communities across states coming together to find the owner. For the Post and family in southern Indiana, the powerful line of storms didn't initially leave an impact. We were watching the storm cells, you know, move through Kentucky and hearing that there was likely going to be massive amounts of damage. That's until something small landed on Katie Poston's car. Yeah, you know, ran out to my car to grab something and, you know, saw what looked like a slip of paper on the window. But it wasn't just a slip of paper. This was someone's priceless family photo. On the front, there is a woman sitting with a little boy in her lap. And the back says Gertie Swatzel and J.D. Swatzel, um, and then was dated 1942. When I came across this on my car on Saturday morning, was just astounded and you know and heartbroken really to realize this photo had come to our house because someone else's home had been damaged. With just a few taps, Katie posted that photo on social media, hoping someone knew that family. I posted it late Saturday morning, um, sometime between 9.30 and 10. Um, within an hour, you know, the internet sleuths had figured out that there was a family that went by the name Swatzel in the Dawson Springs area. Dozens of homes in the small town of Dawson Springs destroyed. That photo blown by the storm all the way to New Albany, Indiana, a journey of almost 130 miles. As for the photo's long journey back home, that will have to wait. I have been in touch with them, um, with a couple of family members, and told them, you know, I'm happy to wait. Um, keep it safe until you guys get your legs back under you. But this photo, just one of thousands, one Facebook group nearing almost 2,000 posts of found items. It's really, really amazing to scroll the group um, and see like there's pension papers and there's birth certificates and prom photos. Priceless memories that will soon be reunited with their families. These are, are some things that money can't buy. These are memories that families, you know, felt like were lost forever. Um, and if we can do the work to get them home, um, you know, can provide hopefully a little bit of support in a way that is really intangible. Our thoughts and prayers with everyone in the tornado zone tonight. Thanks for watching Top Story. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.